Well, he's one of the most famous political analysts in America, and in his new book, Things That Matter, Charles Krauthammer also gives us his observations on art, science, beauty, popular culture, and a whole lot of other things, in, as well as insight into his own personal life. Take a look at this. Charles Krauthammer is known to millions of nightly television viewers as an insightful political analyst and conservative commentator on the Fox News nightly program Special Report with Brett Baer. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winning syndicated columnist and now he's taken 30 years of his keen observations on politics and life and turned that collection of essays into a best-selling book called Things That Matter. Well, I want to say this book is delightful. It's Charles Krauthammer, he's been pushing this book, and he's been on a book tour, and I'm glad he's with us. It's called Things That Matter. Uh, he's got about 30 years, and he's picked up all kinds of columns. Charles, it's so nice to have you with us. Your insight has been a thrill to me. I love watching you on TV, so thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Hey, listen, uh, last chapter in your book, you're talking about uh, the so-called unipolar world. Uh, and uh, the people in America who do not think our country is capable of assuming the role of world leader, and they're doing various things to uh, diminish that role. Could you, uh, in, you know, enlarge on that some for us? Well, that's one of the big struggles between left and right. And I think Obama's taken it beyond just being unwilling to take on the burden, as we see leading from behind has been the way to describe the kind of foreign policy of neglect and of abdication that characterizes his administration. Just the latest, you report a little earlier on the deal with Iran, which I think is utterly catastrophic. Both the Saudis, the uh, UAE, the, uh, the Gulf Arabs, and the Israelis are in a near panic over this. But I think with Obama, it goes a little bit deeper. I think with him, there's a sense that America doesn't have the moral right to lead the world. Uh, and I think that's a, a distinct difference from previous administrations and previous presidents. Well, what is he doing? You, you've pointed out, I mean, for example, trying to diminish our capacity to supply uh, fossil fuels and that kind of thing. Well, you know, like many liberals, they dream of a different world and, you know, with central planning. Obama has this notion that we have to radically change our energy, uh, our energy system. He speaks about oil as the as the energy source of the past, it is not of the past, it's of the present, and it's of the future. We have now become, as a result of our new techniques of fracking, the Saudi Arabia of gas and oil, and we are the leading producer on the planet of gas and oil, and we have leaders who want to wean us off gas and oil to start us, you know, to run the country on wind power. You can't run autos on wind power. And this is sort of a dream they have. Perhaps in a hundred years the technology will be ripe, but it's not ripe now. And the, and the real problem with socialists historically has been they try to force the future on the present, and in doing so, there are a lot of casualties. Well, we've certainly had it now. We're talking about 52 million people may lose their um health insurance, this is a monstrous thing that has been imposed on the people. How do you suppose the Democrats got that thing through Congress? They didn't have any Republican support at all. As Nancy Pelosi said, we have to pass it to know what's in it. <laughs> the vast majority had no idea what was in it. It was written, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. The regulations are now up to 20,000 pages. They had the vague idea we're going to sort of help the uninsured, but as you said earlier, Instead of specifically going after the uninsured and trying to get a program that look after them, the instinct of these social planners was to completely redo, completely reorganize one-sixth of the American economy. I mean, imagine, Pat, the hubris in thinking that you can get a bunch of experts in Washington who will be able to write the regulations that will harmoniously revolutionize this very, very delicate and complicated ecosystem called medicine. I used to be a physician. I worked at the Mass General Hospital as a resident and chief resident. And there are so many unintended consequences of this bill that are all going to intersect. And we are now seeing just the very beginning with the cancellation of the insurance of millions of Americans who like what they had and were promised solemnly by the president 
that that would remain undisturbed. That essentially was a lie. Do you, do you think he's low? I mean, he's obviously he's down on the pole, but do you, do you think this uh, makes some status of his future or the rest of this term? I mean, has he lost all credibility with the American people? I think he has. I mean, I write in the book, there are a lot of columns on the beginning of his presidency where it was clear that he was going to be sort of the most radical social president, you know, in terms of his social program that we've had in at least 70 years. And the problem is, Pat, you cannot govern a country that is only 20 percent liberal from the hard left position. You cannot govern a country that's 80 percent non-liberal. He could for two years when they had the temporary majority, but now the chickens are coming home to roost and Americans are turning against that kind of central planning, that kind of political arrogance. I want to switch gears. Your book is filled with so many interesting things that uh, I commend it to our audience, by the way. Uh, you were writing about Israel. I'm so, you know, a great Israeli. They say I've got the Star of David on my underwear. But in any event, you, you said that the diaspora was good for the Jewish people ultimately and that the centralization of the Jews in Israel uh, is, is a great danger if there's another major shock. Could you, and you want to amplify that? Well, yeah, I have a whole section on Israel in the book. Several um, of the columns are in defense of Israel because it has been mercilessly attacked, not just physically, but rhetorically and morally around the world, with not many people, and you being a notable exception, uh, defending it. And that's who I feel I have an obligation to. But the irony, I'm a very big Zionist. I believe in the Zionist idea. I do believe that the Jews have a right to return to their homeland. And that is ultimately the only place where they will find safety. After the Holocaust, it is clear the Jews have to be able to defend themselves and they cannot rely on anyone. We saw what happened in Europe. They relied on the British and the French and ultimately the world abandoned them. However, there's a great irony in this because in the past when the Jews were dispersed for 2,000 years and they were attacked relentlessly, and liquidated in many places. The thing is that because they were spread out, they could be decimated in one part of the globe and survive in another. So even though the individual communities, which were defenseless, spread out, were extremely vulnerable, as a collective, the Jews were protected by their dispersion. The irony is that with the ingathering of the exiles, and you know that Israel became just a few years ago the largest center of Jewish life, the largest Jewish population on earth. And that hasn't happened since the time of Jesus. So now the majority of Jews are going to be living in Israel. And the irony is it's a very small country. You know, the Iranians call it a one bomb country, meaning a few nuclear weapons and you can do the Holocaust in one day rather than six years as the Nazis did. And that's the danger. And that's why it is so important that the world not allow a potentially genocidal regime like the Iranian regime to acquire the weapon that could perpetuate and actually carry out a second Holocaust instantly and without any warning. That's why the Israelis are so upset, why you heard the prime minister say, not on my watch. This time, the Jews will not allow the world to abandon them. Uh, one last question. Uh, you, you talked, you, you're Canadian, and you talked about uh, the, the, the uh, U.S. English and the, the, the danger of having uh, a split country with French and uh, uh, Francophone and uh, Anglophone. What, what do you think? Are you, are you telling uh, America that's the, that we should get one language and stick with English? Is that, that's pretty clear in your book. Well, if a slight correction. I'm not Canadian. I was born here. My, I moved to Canada when I was five, prudently bringing my parents with me, <laughs> uh, but left. But I left at age 20 to go to medical school and to go to Oxford. Okay. So I've always been American, but I grew up in Canada and I love Canada, but it is a bilingual country. And I lived through all the troubles in Quebec and Montreal that arose over the struggle between the two language ethnicities. And the plea I have is that here we are a country in the United States 
that has always had one language, English, to bring us together, to Americanize all our immigrants. And it would be a terrible thing to forfeit the unity that comes with one language gratuitously. In Canada, they have no choice because the founding peoples were, one were British, one were French. So they began as a bilingual country, but it creates friction as you see in Belgium, as you see in other countries. So if you have the benefit and the heritage of a common language as we do, it is something trying to worth preserve. Last question, and by the way, this, this book again, ladies and gentlemen, is just filled with things. I can't possibly go into all of this so much in here, but your brother was so precious in your life and so important. Uh, would you, let's close with him. Well, actually, I, I start the book with the column I wrote um, shortly after he died, and it's really derived from the remarks I made at the gravesite. Uh, he was older than me, just the two of us, the only uh, two siblings. And what was remarkable about him is that he was the ideal older br brother everybody wants to have when they're a child. Uh, and he sort of accepted me as his peer, included me among his friends. So that taught me a great lesson, being able to compete with the big boys early on. And that inclusion, I think, sort of prepared me <laughs> for the trials of life. And I write in that column about the magical, paradisical summers that we spent together, really inseparable for year after year until he went off to medical school and I went my own way. But those summers are what I recall in the column. And there's a kind of melancholy that everybody who grows up remembers the youth that was once there and is now past. But in him, it was all symbolized in sort of a wonderful generous, protective, older brotherhood. Do you think America's going to make it? Uh, are we so selfish now that we're going to continue to vote uh, wasteful spending out of the federal treasury? Or are we going to uh, come back to some kind of fiscal discipline? I think one of the things you'll find in the book, ultimately, is a kind of optimism about America. I've always had this sense of a providential hand. You know, we, we are a country in this, the end of the 1700s were a little island of Western civilization, cut off small number of people, and we developed the greatest generation of political geniuses in the history of mankind who give us the Constitution. The next century, we need a Lincoln, we get a Lincoln. In the 20th, we needed an FDR in the Depression, and in the Second World War, and then in the second half of the century, we needed a Reagan, and we got a Reagan. Now, I can't explain all this. In some sense, I think it comes out of the basic common sense and decency of the American people who, one way or the other, find a way. You know, Churchill once said, the Americans always do the right thing after they have tried everything else. <laughs> so here we are trying everything else, but I think in the end, we're going to do the right thing. Well, I'm sure they will. And with your leadership, uh, thank you for you. We, we really love you and appreciate your your insightful remarks night after night on Fox, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Charles Krauthammer, ladies and gentlemen, is called Things That Matter. You really ought to get this. It's got so much stuff in it that I can't possibly tell you all about it. man. I just watched uh, an hour-long special on his yeah. life that was remarkable. Well, this, this book, you could, you could get an insight into his mind if you just get this book, and it's a terrific book. And it's, it's Christmas books. time. Great gift. Uh, huh? It would be a tremendous <laughs> gift.